In this mini lecture, we're going to talk about the literature of sensibility and its relationship to the works we're reading this semester. You might hear me use the terms literature of sensibility and sentimental literature interchangeably. The literature of sensibility, or sentimental literature, refers to a popular trend from the 18th century. The whole point of sensibility is to think of emotional vulnerability as a highly desirable trait. Now, the term sentimental literature is pretty clear, but the literature of sensibility, less so. The reason why is because this word sensibility, it's not really part of our everyday speech. But if we tried to guess what it meant, we'd wind up with the wrong answer. The word sensibility and sensible are clearly from the same root, but while sensible is just reasonable or rational, sensibility really just means emotional sensitivity. Now, the funny thing about sensibility as a human trait is that it was supposed to show the measure of a person's intrinsic worth. In other words, the more emotionally sensitive you appeared, the better person you clearly were. As you can imagine, the competition to emote was stiff, both for the heroes and the heroines of these novels and for the people who read them. Sentimental novels taught people that they could be better human beings if they would just allow themselves to be governed by their emotions. Over time, the act of reading novels came to be seen as the cause of emotional hysteria, and readers of those novels were seen as silly, weak, and entirely affected. One of the most famous sentimental novels of the 18th century was Samuel Richardson's Pamela. Its full title was Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded. This novel was written in epistolary form and was originally written as a conduct manual. Richardson thought he would use his book to teach young and impressionable readers how to behave. As he wrote, however, he saw a story emerging, and so in 1740 it was published as a novel. The story of Pamela goes like this. Following the death of her mother, young Pamela, only 15 years old, goes to work as a servant in the house of Mr. B. Throughout the novel, Mr. B actively tries to seduce her, but she rebuffs his advances. In the end, he is revealed to be a moral person, and so she marries him. Pamela's virtue guides her conduct and eventually rewards her with a marriage and a fortune. So those paintings were by the painter Joseph Highmore. They were part of a collection of scenes that he painted from Pamela. They represent a shift in his career when he began to aim for a middle class audience. Pamela too appealed to both middle and upper class readers and that's worth pondering for a minute. Today if we talk about mass market paperbacks, about the people who read the books at the top of the New York Times bestseller list, we're still talking about a relatively small portion of our population. We really haven't seen too many books recently that have crossed class boundaries and that have had a general readership larger than the people who usually read books. Maybe The Da Vinci Code, and maybe Harry Potter. Now, think for a minute about the magnitude of Dan Brown or J.K. Rowling's success, and that should give you an idea about how popular Pamela was. Pamela was so celebrated that it spawned an entire industry of Pamela memorabilia. We're talking about teacups with her faces painted on them, personal fans, wax miniatures. Pamela wasn't just a literary phenomenon. She was England's heroine. She was a symbol of upward mobility. She was proof that virtue would be rewarded. Now, Pamela is an example of the power of sentimental literature, but it also reveals the cultish tendencies of readers to become personally involved with figures in the novel. The literature of sensibility managed to influence its readers, convincing them not only to change their tastes, but also to alter their own behavior. It promised that a more emotional person might find financial, marital, or religious reward. I'd like to shift gears a bit now to talk about the role of the novel in all of this. Is there something about this form that makes it more inclined to produce such a passionate response from its readers? Is the novel a genre? Well, let's step back a minute and ask, what is a genre? And are some genres more important or valuable than others? 
There are a few answers to the question, what is a genre? Today, because we have so many genres and subgenres floating around, we're not really aware of the origins of this term. And at the same time, we all sort of have this gut feeling that we know what genre means. If we're going to take genre at its absolute and most basic meaning, there are only three genres, and they are prose, poetry, and drama. Now on to the next question, can we rank these? Are some better, higher, or more refined? Poetry is the oldest genre, and it has the closest relationship to song and has its roots in an oral tradition that predates the written word. English is not a particularly old language, but poetry is an old genre, which means that by writing poetry, English writers could align themselves with the likes of Homer, Ovid, Virgil, and the other poets of antiquity. So in fact, poetry has been the most valued form, not because of some intrinsic quality, but because it comes before the other genres. So if I asked my mother what her favorite genre was, she'd answer mystery. And if I asked my brother, he'd reply science fiction. If I asked my husband, he'd look down his nose at me and answer, I only read nonfiction. My father would say that he likes to read and watch operas. My answer would be simply poetry. Despite what appears to be an incredibly splintered and varied bunch of literary genres, there is, in fact, a kind of hierarchy in place. My mom prefers mysteries and my brother science fiction, but they both choose novels, which are fictional and, according to my husband, totally boring, but less boring than the operas that my dad prefers. Of all of us, I've used the term genre in its most absolute purest sense. My mother, brother, and husband all prefer one genre and that is prose. My father, he prefers drama. Now, the Greeks also wrote plenty of dramas, but English drama and Greek drama are quite different, especially in the 18th century. English audiences were particularly crass, and so were most of the popular plays. Tickets were shockingly cheap, theaters were enormous, and with no modern methods of amplification, an 18th century theater goer went to the theater not to listen to the lines, but to watch the pantomimes get drunk and eat snacks. This drawing is by the satirist William Hogarth, depicting the chaos of a London theater audience. Poetry has its roots in classical literature, and drama is for the masses. But what about prose? As modern readers, we have to remember that we're very much a prose-centric society. You've spent most of your life reading prose, but poetry is foreign to you. Most of us cut our teeth on novels, but the reason why our education was so prose-heavy is that prose is seen as more accessible, easier to read than poetry. It's more consumer-minded and seen as more direct in its message. Our teachers were supposed to teach us literature, but they were also supposed to impart a passion for reading. This has been our approach to literacy and general education for several decades. Our entire view of literature has been shaped by the idea that novels are fun and easy to read. Poetry might be older and more venerated, but today we've been alienated from it. Now we might find an analogy in the popularity of film as it enters the classroom, replacing written texts in primary and secondary education. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with recycling old genres and adopting new ones. The bottom line is that we have to get our youngest students to think critically about the world around them. And if film helps us do that, then great. That said, our preference or taste tends to run in cycles. Poetry has come and gone out of vogue with some regularity, novels as well. Maybe we can look forward to a modern return to poetry, and until then, my husband will still think of poetry as an antiquated and useless genre, and I will persist in defending it.